Good morning and welcome to Let's Talk Autism. I'm Nancy Allspaugh Jackson. And I'm Shannon Penrod. And Hi, Shannon. I'm thankful. I don't get to see you as much anymore because your offices have moved, and so this is a treat for Not me. Not the same building. It's a and treat for me, too. You're looking all share today. Am I? Yes, with My your fur jacket. Uh, that kind of uh, vest reminds me of, you My know. Faux fur. That uh, that share sort of sunny and share uh, kind of thing because didn't they have vests that were like vests back in did. the sixties? Yeah, um, and for those of you who don't know, Nancy was share for Halloween, Halloween this yeah. last year, which was very when you very were fun. Adele. But you know, people looked at pictures of it and said that we looked more like the Ab Fab women. Oh, now, really? I don't know Ab Fab. I'm not an Ab Fab person. One of them, Patsy, uh, had blonde hair and a big beehive. I well, but I had I I was Adele and had right, the big true. the big blonde beehive so I don't know I need to look up and see if in fact who we looked more like okay because uh, they thought they just looked at the picture and they were like oh they're the ab fat oh, well, okay um, so anyway but we had a good time we always have a good time you uh, we, we need and to Halloween. start thinking about what we're gonna be for Halloween this year because it's about it takes us about that long you it guys does. <laughs> In any case, we've got uh, a great show uh, planned for you guys today. We've got some in the news, and we've got a great guest, Stephen Gaber, who's going to be with us, and he's calling himself the Autistic Traveler. And uh, a couple of weeks ago, we had the folks from Autism Works Now with us, the job candidates. These were all individuals who were on the autism spectrum. And we did a separate interview with each one of them. We had done this, by the way, uh, a year and a half before, but Nancy was the one who interviewed them because I had the pneumonia. Remember mm -hmm. that when yes, I was just I did. leveled? And um, so it was my first time getting to meet all the candidates and interview them. And, and it was just, so, it was so wonderful. Um, and Stephen was one of the candidates. And during the interview, uh, we were talking to him and, you know, I said, you know, what do you want to do? What would you like to do? And he said he loves to travel and that he'd love to have like a travel vlog or blog or whatever. And I kind of gave him a challenge, like right in the middle of the live show and said, Stephen, why don't you go do something, film it, and send it to us, and, and then we'll have you back on the and show. And did he take you up And on let it? me just tell you, there was no moss grown under his feet, right? He was so on it, and he went to the L.A. Travel Expo. He shot some video. We kind of edited it together a little bit, so you guys are going to see that video in a little while, and we'll have Steven in, and he'll tell us about so He's been, I mean, I'm not a traveler. I'm just not. I mean, right. I've been all over the United States, but uh, it's I've only been to Canada. I've never mm -hmm. even been to Mexico. Really? Never in my life. And we live like a right. stone's throw away. Um, and I've never been overseas. You know, I'm just boring. Uh, not <laughs> not for lack of curiosity, but just other things that took priority. Right, right. right. So it's fascinating to me because Stephen has been everywhere. That's uh, fascinating. So I'm pretty excited hearing about his travels. Yeah. So that'll be fun. How Plus, brave he is to do all this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, oh, I, I don't even think it's a question of that for him. It's just desire. So right. I don't think he thinks of it as being brave. Uh, but we'll talk with Stephen, and he's just fantastic. So that'll be really fun. And um, we've got some great in the news and some other things for us to talk about as well. Lots going on. And, and you guys wrote in a lot of questions during the last hour, so we're going to try to get to some questions. But should we jump in with some news first? Yes, let's do okay. it. Okay. Okay. Uh, so I, I just there's a, a, an article in the Washington Post right now that I, I thought was worthy of everybody's note. We're not going to read the whole thing to you, but the title of it is "I Stopped Calling Autistic People High Functioning Because of My Son," and here's why. And this kind of goes hand in hand with a little bit what we were talking about this morning. That so often people, we everybody likes a label and yes. put things in nice little boxes. Well, is it good or is it bad? Right? Is it high or low? Yeah. Is it, you know, whatever. And we're, I'm guilty of that. I, I want to do that all the time. Mm -hmm. Put things in a little box. And so often nothing is. And, and nothing fits in a box. Nothing is clearly black or white. You know, everything it seems to be kind of gray. And that a lot of times people will want to say, oh, well, there's high functioning. Because high functioning is and then fill in the blank right. what that supposedly means. And it's very easy to look at somebody and go, well, now look, they're high functioning. So we don't feel the same amount of empathy for them or maybe sympathy and that it's a so-called situa situation that needs to be remedied. Well, and I think that, yeah, I think that people just sort of dismiss it. Well, they're high functioning. Right, so, so they'll do fine. So they don't really have problems and, and there's nothing going on and there's nothing so overwhelming um, because we know for people who are profoundly affected, those of us in the community know that every single day can be, you know, a struggle. And that things can come out of the blue that are unexpected. I think that the community of autism accepts that. 
Um, but even the, outside the community, forget it. They don't even, they don't understand. They, you know, and, and we keep working on acceptance and information and we'll keep doing that with our last breath, right? But I think it's important for at least the community of autism to acknowledge that even for the high functioning folks, there are sometimes huge challenges and for the family huge challenges. Challenges, And that's what this article is about. A mom who has one of those high functioning kids who, and she describes an incident in which he has a meltdown over something that is so minute and, and just really upsets his whole apple cart, upsets the family's apple cart, and, and you really get a sense reading this of what it's like to live with, I don't know what could happen next. Right. Even when 99% of the time things are great and your kid is doing great, the fact that one percentage of the time things can go off into a meltdown that can be devastating and and that you know it's not just that one percent of the time because you live in in fear of it so much more of the other 99 percent time so really want to encourage people read this article um and so that we can all at least acknowledge that everyone on the spectrum has unique challenges Mm -hmm. and 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 not quantify them not like look at high functioning as being good and dismiss or bad right. um, because it's neither it is what it is mm-hmm. and sometimes it's really stinking hard yeah it's um, a very interesting perspective that this mom has it made her stop calling people high functioning because of her son even though he is what's called quote high functioning yeah and it's um i mean i think it's just unfortunately a way now that has been adopted when people say high functioning to, to kind of dismiss uh, things. I always love what Elaine Hall says. She doesn't use the terms high functioning, uh, and and I hope nobody's using low functioning because that doesn't even apply. I think people I tend to say more profoundly affected, affected right? Um, but Elaine doesn't even use those terms. She says, you know, because it depends on the context. Mm-hmm. And and I remember her telling the story about you know if you take my son and you put him in a classroom where they're gonna debate something vocally that's about politics, you know, you would look at my son and go, uh, okay, this is somebody, you know, who doesn't have skills. Mm-hmm. But if you wanna go on the side of a mountain and throw a bunch of gear on the floor and say to everybody, now pack it up so we can go up the mountain, mm-hmm. her kid's gonna be the highest functioning person on the side of that mountain. Mm-hmm. So context has everything to do with yes. everything. And I think that that's a a better way of looking at things. I agree. In any case, um, so, uh, you know, did you hear that there's a new National Autism Coordinator? I did, Dr. Ann Wagner for the national, from the National Institute of Mental Health. And I'm excited about this. I want you to know that we did reach out okay. to uh, the National uh, Institute of uh, Mental Health and we asked for an interview. So we're waiting to hear back. And okay. we hope that we will have an opportunity for you and I to sit down with Dr. Ann Wagner and talk about some of the things that are on her agenda. Um, you know, this is this is a pretty important role. And um, it'll I, complement the activities of the Interagency Autism Coordinating Committee. Yeah. And, you know, um, I'm a little skeptical about that organization. I was so thrilled when that was formed. And we see that they meet once every, you know, year and a Mm -hmm, mm half-ish. And they have speakers. And they throw out an agenda and people speak. And um, woohoo! I'm just waiting for them to do something, like even, you know, light a fire somewhere. And and go, we're just just going to light this people. Yeah. Yeah. Like... uh, very, you Real know, I'm all about information. Action. Knowledge is power, but let's see some movement. Right. Um, yeah. So uh, I'd love to talk to Dr. Ann Wagner. I think she, based on her um, past, I think she's a mover and a shaker, and I mm-hmm. think she could be somebody who could really make some stuff happen. And that's what I'm looking for is for some stuff to happen. Uh, okay. Um, and then uh, another sorry. story about a mom who. Had a complaint from a neighbor. And this is very similar to one that we had like a year ago, right? right? But this one is being covered by Self Magazine. um, And we actually have, uh, we don't have a good copy of some of the things that, so basically they move into a neighborhood and they've got a garden Mm -hmm. and their kiddo who's on the spectrum 
goes out into the garden. And, and hit their, their child's particular stem is making humming and making yeah. noises. We call it vocal stereotypy, right. right? My kid is one of those kids. Does Wyatt make noises? Yes, he does. And um, so he goes out in his own backyard, in his own garden, and he makes noises. And sometimes there's noises that come from the house. Right. And sometimes they're loud. I'm sure it's disturbing. Mm -hmm. um, but a neighbor put an anonymous letter in her mailbox um, that I'm sure the neighbor thought was being, you know, because people context again mm -hmm. people come from the place that they know and I think that the neighbor thought that they were doing something nice and saying look we all live here right and this is very disturbing and mm -hmm. we reported you to the police and the police came and then you know we've been told that there's something else going on with your child with a mental disturbance with your child yeah and um, so she says I sympathize with your situation um, but I kindly request that you consider your neighbors and try to limit the amount of time that is spent in the garden such that we do not have, that we do not have to listen to the disturbing noise daily and sometimes before 6 a.m. And, and I gotta say, I'm sure that that woman thought, well, that's reasonable. Mm -hmm. It's reasonable to say that I live here and I own my home and I don't want noise, disturbing noises before 6 a.m., right? Uh, and before we had kids with autism, we might have felt differently about that and said, yes, that's really reasonable. The mom wrote her back a note and, and basically said, uh, you know, if you think it's hard uh, to listen to right. it occasionally, imagine what it's like to listen to it By all the By the way, time. the neighbor also threatened to contact a lawyer. Oh, yeah. She said, if, you know, if this can't be taken mm -hmm. care of, that, you know, perhaps I'll need to uh, contact legal. Um, and the mom, you know, wrote back, I thought, a very efficient note uh, basically that said, you know, uh, go ahead, you know, and, call, call your right. lawyer. And shared um, all this on Facebook and got yes. an outpouring of support on Facebook. Yes, absolutely. And I, and I think, you know, I mean, it's perspective taking. I love that Dr. Grand Pichet always says when you look at all problems in the world, they all come down to a lack of perspective taking. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm sure that this woman has no earthly idea what it's like to have a child who screams. I always go back to a moment when I was having a really rough day and Jem had already tantrumed several times and I needed to go to the grocery store. And I, put, I took him, I put him in the little um, cart in the grocery store and he was having a rough time and I was trying to get him to sit in it and I was trying to go around a corner to get something and he had gotten out of the seat and I was trying to deal with it and, and I'd been told how to deal with it and I was trying to go through this like six step process to deal with it, to not take him out, um, but to give him sensory input and get him back into the seat. And there was a woman, it was a Sunday, it was a Sunday afternoon, and there was a woman who was clearly just coming from church with her two teenage kids who were clearly neurotypical. And clearly, clearly something else was going on in their life. Right. They were really, you know, hang face and they had just come from church and they were very nicely dressed, but everybody seemed a little down. And I don't know whether somebody had just passed away or if the dad had just left. I mean, we could guess. Clearly they had something going on. But um, to them, they were the only people having something going on. And to me, I was the only person having something going on. And we collided uh, over the, like, you know, packaged cheeses. We collided because I was standing there working through the six-step process, and my child was screaming, and she came over and let me know with all her huff and whatever that I was not doing a good job parenting and that I should never have this child in the grocery store if I didn't know how to handle him. And I, and I remember looking at her two neurotypical kids and thinking, really? Really? Did you go off on her or did you um, go back? I didn't. Um, because I tend to, as verbose as I am in a lot of circumstances, if it was happening to you and Wyatt next to me, mm -hmm. I would have been on that woman and saying, clearly you have something going on, but so does she, mm -hmm. and you're not the only person having it. Like, I could do that for somebody else, but in the moment, I get paralyzed. Right. I totally get paralyzed, and I left in tears mm -hmm. and went in the parking lot and cried. Once I got him into his five-point harness, cried for like a half an hour um, and thought, you know, this is this is what the rest of my life is going to be right, like. Right. You know that people who who you know have their own things going on and think that you know um, we should just get over our thing. Right, they're going to be judging you. 
and judging him. Mm -hmm. And I think that's part of it too, right? We're all like, it's painful. To it feel is painful like, to have your child judged. And, and to feel like, I mean, I don't know how many times you feel like you've been told that you're a bad parent, but I feel like I was told that a lot. Yeah, I feel like I've been given that, that message a lot through either words or, or yeah. gestures or. Yeah, and, and, and I know whenever I'm talking to therapists and professionals, I, I say, look, I'm just gonna tell you my experience, my default is that something happens, I immediately go to, you know, oh, this is my fault. Right. I'm a bad parent. I didn't do this, I didn't do that. And it doesn't matter how many people tell you, you know, you're a great parent. For me, that's still a default that I go to. When I think, in fact, we're all doing the best we can. Right. Right? Um, so anyway, there's that soapbox. Okay. Uh, anyway, uh, we've got a great show for you guys, and we've got your questions coming up. Um, but first, we're going to take a break, and then we're going to bring Stephen Gaber, the autistic traveler, in, and we're going to... Uh, when he's in here, we're not going to show it yet, we're going to show how we sort of edited together some of the footage that he took. So okay. stick with us, you guys. He's a treat. You say hi, we say hi. Let's get wild, let's get wild. Let's get, let's get, 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 let's get wild. Hi, Lisa Ackerman from Ataka here to do some more cooking. Are you ready? Allergy friendly fun and I've got a guest. I'm Jamie Davis. Yes, I'm her sister. Today we're all about cooking something really fun and healthy. That's a dessert. We're going to actually use carrots, real carrots, and uh, we're going to talk about how to make the best tasting carrot cake you could ever hope for. So it's really easy. You don't want to buy the carrots that are the baby carrots. Why? Well, those aren't really carrots. What they do is they take carrots, they mush them all up, they took whatever the carrot looks like, they throw it in a bin, they bleach them, and they process them, and then they have a little machine that makes them into little formed baby carrots. So they're really not born that way. So this is what a carrot really looks like? Yeah. Awesome, good to know. So I just wanna show everybody how to make really simply, we just washed off the carrots, they were really dirty from the farmer's market. And we're going to throw them in to our food processor. So what's good about the food processor um, is that we can go for a really fine grade. So I'm going to go ahead and add the three cups of carrots. Then the next thing I'm going to pull in is our gluten-free, casein-free flours. I'm using a protein-based flour. Um, Bob's Red Mill is great. I also have my flaxseed meal and pure cane sugar that's organic. Uh, I cut it down already so you don't need to cut it again. And one of the reasons why we like to use organic sugar is because once again most sugars on the market are bleached to make them look perfect. Yeah, We don't like perfect. No. We like ours. That's why we like each other. <laughs> <laughs> Alright, so we've added our baking soda, baking powder, xanthan gum, nutmeg, and salt. Now again why we use the gums is that's the uh, ingredient that actually holds the flour together. Regular flour automatically has that gluten. This is the replacement to the gluten. These are the secret ingredients for the cake itself. Three quarters of a cup of the crushed pineapple is in there. That gives it a beautiful texture and flavor. And now what I'm using is um, the oil. What are your favorite oils, Jamie? I like using coconut oil any chance yes. I get. In fact, coconut oil would be excellent in a carrot cake. And what I did was I took a reserved a little bit of the oil and we placed it in the bottom of that pan so it doesn't stick. Yep. But we love the baking stones. Yes. Why do we love the baking stones? Evenly cooks. Yes. And easy cleanup. If you like crispy, you got to get a baking stone. I also feel that they're less toxic. So now I'm going to cook this thing at 350 uh, for about 35 minutes. You really want to get it golden. Let's get it in there. Awesome. So now that we got our cake all done, let's get on with the frosting. Coconut oil, probably the best thing in the world you can eat. Uh, it's so good for your brain. It's one of the best oils that we can use. So I'm going to use a third cup of the coconut oil. Goosh. And then we're going to do one teaspoon of um, an organic vanilla, Madagascar, and, and make sure it's alcohol free. And then what we're going to do is add 16 ounces of organic powdered sugar. 
And we're going to add our four to six uh, tablespoons of coconut milk. I'm using the whisk version here on the KitchenAid, which will give it a nice mix. All right, so if you get any on the sides, you just come on in with your little spatula. And this makes the best frosting for the cake. So we're almost done whipping it up. And voila, we are talking good stuff right here. We have the best situation for the best birthday cake, especially if you want to deal with something that perhaps has a little less sugar. You've got a great cake that no one will know the difference. I'm not a decorator. I don't like to decorate. I just want to eat it, and I don't care what it looks like. Ask my family. I'm a family with autism. I just want to eat the cake. Are you ready to do this? It can be your birthday. Yay! Yay! So to me, oh goodness, this so is so good. It's meant to be gooey, as you can see. Um, but what I love about this is a great birthday cake with an extra frosting to make your kids happy. A little less sugar and a lot of love. So if you have any questions, we'd love to hear from you. You can email us at autismlive at gmail.com and on Facebook, Facebook slash Autism Live. And then you can reach me and Jamie and get some more ideas from the Taco Recipe site. So let's have some more things. You say howdy, we say hi. Let's go out, let's go out. Let's go, let's go, let's go out. What is autism? 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 Uh, <laughs> I've been asking myself that for a very, very long time. Um, let me think about that one. <laughs> trying to, uh, just, um... Jeez. Let me think. <laughs> oh, man, that's a tough one. Yes. Uh, autism, uh... Autism is a neurological disorder that affects many of our kids in different ways. It's a learning disability that affects the cognitive functions of the brain. A lot of people have the misconception that it's a disability, and it's really not. I look at it as, like, a special gift. When one person thinks differently from another. It's an opportunity for everyone to learn to understand someone that's a little different than them. Autism is the ability to educate. They're given so much talent in different areas. To me, autism means a chance to be with and be around people you really care about. Autism is beautiful. It's a way of seeing the world differently. Always unique, totally intelligent, and sometimes mysterious. Happiness that, that, that comes out of my um, son's um, hard work. It's a movement. Unpredictable. That's, That's right. right. Awesome. Love. The field I want to work in. Laughter. Fun. Joy. Autism is beautiful to me. I want you to remember these three words. There is hope. And welcome back to Autism Live with Shannon and Nancy. Autism Live, let's talk autism. Yeah. Um, and we are talking autism with a special guest. We have Stephen Gaber. Is that correct? Is that how you pronounce your name, Stephen? Yes, it is. Okay. And Shannon, you met this young man through Autism Works Now. Yes. I think the first time that we met, there was we were at a holiday party for Autism Works Now in uh, right before the beginning of the year. And I was really impressed with Stephen, thought that he was fabulous, and uh, and said at some point he needed to come on the show. Then we had all of the Autism Works Now candidates on. And there was this moment between us, Stephen, where you were telling me what you wanted to do. And I kind of gave you a challenge. And I said, Stephen, why don't you go film, when you go on a trip, go film something and send us clips from it, and then we'll have you back on the show. And I was saying before that I loved that you took me very seriously and that you very quickly uh, went and you did the LA Travel Expo, right? The LA Travel and Adventure Show was the show I attended. And you sent me clips, and I was saying to you during the break that I was really impressed that you really have a sense of what things need to be shot to make a package. And I'm assuming that part of that is because you have a degree, and tell the folks at home what your degree is in. My degree is in cinema and television arts with an emphasis in screenwriting. 
There okay. you go. And, but you have this sense of what, you know, there, we, we call things a package. And, you know, when you send people out and say, okay, you know, go shoot this event because we want to put together a package. And it has to have a beginning and a middle and an end. And there's some things that go better in a package than others. Nancy has great experience in this. I'm telling you, Stephen has a real sense. He sent us... Um, some clips and okay. we will tell you and we've already said to Stephen that there were some issues with the sound mm -hmm. um, and but we're talking with Stephen about how he can up his sound quality because Stephen went and shot this on his phone um, so should we de debut the yeah, video that we put together yes debut the video you're okay. not going to be able to hear it because you don't have an IFB Stephen but you'll be able to see it so watch up on the screen here is Stephen at uh, this event <laughs> riding that camel it was a lot of fun it was a it was a lot of fun riding the camel <laughs> however I rode a camel in Israel and that was the real deal but for a little expo it was pretty interesting actually and it was fun for what it was plus it was free yeah <laughs> absolutely and I just want to say as we were talking through it I was I was talking with you and Nancy about the way in which you went and shot this it had all the elements of what a package would be that you you did an opener, mm -hmm. you had some great B-roll that gave us a sense of the size and scope of what was happening, mm -hmm. you did an interview, you asked good questions, um, and then you had something fun that's like the dessert at the end of the meal, right? That we have him on the camel, which is this funny shot. It's really your sense of how to put that together and what to shoot 
was great. You didn't send me three hours worth of footage. I mean, basically what he, what he sent us is what you guys saw. We just edited it together. And as I mentioned, there were some sound issues. So Samantha, we have to say thank you to Samantha. She put, took the time to put the subtitles because we couldn't hear with all the background noises when you were doing the interview. But I think if we, you know, and, and I was saying to you that perhaps we, we might have a microphone that we could lend to you um, to, to up, you know, your game a little bit so that we get good sound. Because to me, that's the thing that's missing is the good sound. But I, I just want to say to our viewers. Right, all the elements. To just say, you know, Stephen, go shoot something at the Travel and Expo show. And he's got an iPhone. I, I, an very you know, impressive. I'm pretty impressed. It was an Android, actually. I'm sorry, not no an problem. iPhone, an Android. An it, Android. It, it worked well. You did a very good job putting that piece together. Now, tell tell me about all the places you've traveled, because I don't. I'm not familiar with all your world travels. I have been to over 25 places since graduating high school. So in the last 11 years, and my favorite trip was a trip to China, and I'm hoping to write to do a video about my adventures in China, about what I could recommend to miscellaneous travelers my experiences and how I could motivate those with or without autism to travel the world by giving them the courage to go off and travel anyway. Well, and, and I want to talk about the fact that, you know, one of the reasons why we had you on the show before was to talk about, it was for Autism Works Now, and, and the fact that you, you have this degree, you've been working full time, uh, tell us where, where you work and how long you've been working there. I've been working at Trader Joe's for nearly six years. And, and Trader Joe's is a great place to work. I'm, you know, there's nothing wrong with working at Trader Joe's. It looks like it's really fun. You get to wear colorful shirts. And, you know, it's, it's a decent, honest pay, right? Um, and but, I hear they have great things to say about you as an employee. They do. <laughs> uh, I and love you're that. You're dependable, you're on time, you're yes. great with the customers. Yes. But, but you have higher aspirations. You have, as you said, this degree, and, and you have higher aspirations. And one of the things that you and I talked about before on the show was that um, there's no reason why you can't do other things. And since you have this love of travel and this love of film um, and television, that you, you have this vision of putting them together and having you have a blog now, is that correct? I just started, I posted my first blog with my introduction about my experience with autism and travel, and how I can motivate others to do that. I think that that's a wonderful thing. And so you're going to you're going to write a little bit about your trip to China, but you've got a trip that's coming up. Tell the folks where you're going to go. I'm going to be going to Texas. My first stop will be Austin. Then it will be uh, Dallas. Then Houston. Okay. And and then after that, what do you have planned? Or is it still we don't know. I might be going to Shanghai and Tokyo Disneyland this upcoming summer. How do you wow. finance all these trips? Well, here's a good tip. I have a lot of frequent flyer miles, and I constantly use my airline miles, which I have a Delta card, American card, and a United card. And I constantly take surveys, which gets me United frequent flyer miles. Do you mind how, if I tell the audience how many miles I have on each airline? No, not at all. Oh, I have over 100,000 on both the American and United. And uh, Delta, I have 40, almost 48,000. And I take, t try to take one trip every year using those points. And I use, every, use my credit card for almost everything. Food at miscellaneous restaurants. And did you guys know you could get frequent flyer miles if you dine at miscellaneous restaurants that, that have a deal with the airlines frequent flyer? Or even like if you have an Orbucks credit card, you could even use that for or, or but Bucks points on orbits.com. Wow. So you're using a credit card to buy your everyday kinds of things and then paying off the credit card, but you're getting miles for it? Is that what you're doing? Cor correct. And not only do I pay it, I pay it super early. Like I pay for my car, my car insurance, my groceries, my gas, my movie passes, my gym membership. Uh, Very enterprising, Stephen. Yep. And did you arrive at that yourself, or did somebody help you to know how to do that? I looked at the internet, but my parents helped me out like, for the first uh, few months, because my dad was actually a registered uh, user, even though he never used the card, but he helped me I, my first year after graduating college, and he inspired me to get the United card, which I got. Then, as you know, American and US Airways were merging, and so he thought it would be a good idea for me to get both of them, which I did. 
And then I just figured I'll get Delta just by myself, which I got. Really cool. Now this interest in travel, did it start at a young age or did you develop it later? My parents have taken me all around the world. Actually, they didn't take me, but they inspired me to travel around the world. We went to Hawaii and New York a bunch of times as a kid and Vegas. Okay, so they, that's where you got your love of travel from, is your family. Yes, and my grandparents from the East Coast have traveled all around the world. And now when you go to Texas, I'm just wondering, is this something you travel by yourself or would there be people going with you? I will be traveling by, I, the only tours I've been on were to China and a tour to Europe and Israel. But I primarily have funded my own vacations and have gone by myself. Okay, so you'll go completely by yourself through Texas, and do you set an agenda for yourself of where you're going to go, or do you like to arrive in a city and sort of let it unfold for you? I look online to see all the miscellaneous uh, museums, and I, for big cities such as for Dallas and Houston, there's an activities pass for like 50 to $60, and it contains like five museums, and I'm going to go to there. And I've also done the same for when I went to Chicago, New York, and Boston as well as places in Europe. And tell me again, where are you going in Texas? Because I went to Texas last summer. Tell me where you're going. Dallas, Houston, Austin. Okay, so you're not going to San Antonio. No, I am not. Okay, all right. Because uh, one of the most incredible things I saw last summer was in San Antonio, which is a beautiful city. Mm -hmm. Have you been to San no, Antonio? No, I've never been there. Oh my gosh, it was beautiful. I, I, I want to like. I know you've got your agenda plan, but it's beautiful. They've got all these um, canals with gondolas, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and then there's a mission there, and they have a show that they play on the old mission. Mm. They play a movie on top of it, and things move. It's incredible. It's one of the greatest things I saw. So I'm. I don't know. I'm just putting it on your agenda that if you get the chance to go to San Antonio, um, I think it's worthwhile. And, and if you're going to be in Austin, it's not that far away. Well, I won't have a car, and I already have my plan plans to go check out the museums and walk around the cities in okay. Texas. Okay. All right. Well, we're going to look forward to that. seeing some of those travels. Yeah. Now, you call yourself the autistic travel. How does autism play into what you do? Well, I've had Asperger's my whole life, and I feel since I've been a very high-functioning success story, and I've been very independent. And you know, a lot of people don't travel by themselves or are afraid to, unlike me. Okay. Yeah, that was one of the things Nancy was saying, you know, that it seems very brave that you travel. Yeah. And I was saying, gosh, I don't think that Stephen looks at it that way. Do you think you're brave to go travel or it's just something you love to do? I feel like because it's, it's just simple and I feel anyone could do it. But for some reason, a lot of people don't do it. Yeah, mm -hmm. why do you think that is? Why do you think people don't go? Uh, whether they have the time or the money or they just don't want to put in the effort like I do. Yeah. Well, and I think, too, already you've said things that tell me you know much more about traveling than I do because, you know, I don't have the card and do the frequent flyer miles, uh, which is a very clever thing to do. I don't know why that's never occurred to me before. Do you do that, Nancy? Yeah. No, I don't do it. <laughs> I don't. Right? I'm too lazy. Well, I and it's not even that much work, but I don't right. know. But no. I, I, and I'm also looking up ahead of time. Uh, to see if there's a deal where you can get five museums. I love to go to museums. Uh, that wouldn't occur to me. That would never have occurred to me. So I think that Stephen has great tips. I just want to say, you know, we're going to we're gonna see if we can't help you with a little bit of sound stuff to maybe go on your Texas trip with, depending on the dates and if I need the microphone. But um, I, I also want to put it out there to people who are watching. I think Stephen would be a great person to add to a staff to for a show. show. Yeah, um, to you know, occasionally drop in and, mm -hmm. and have one of these small pieces. He would deliver some of your great adventures stuff. around the world. Um, and good heavens, if you gave him more than an uh, not an iPhone, an Android. If you gave him uh, a camera, uh, I imagine he could do some. And maybe he wouldn't even need it because the 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 phone was just perfect. So Stephen, I hope somebody hires you and gives you a job uh, doing that. Uh, heaven knows, if I had a budget here at Autism Live, I, I think that what you're doing is amazing. I do too, I do too. Do you have any advice for those with autism that might want to travel? Uh, the best advice I can give is just push yourself and do it. Like look up your research, like look up how much your airfare costs. And if you want to go on a frequent flyer program, Get a card like I do for United, Delta, or American, and always try to go on one of those three airlines. Just push yourself to the maximum is the best bet I could say. Okay. Okay. Thank you so much for being with us, Yeah, Stephen. we wish you good luck on your goal of becoming a host of your own show. 
We do hope you, maybe somebody listening today might have some ideas. About absolutely. That. Do you have the website for your blog where people can go? Well, uh, it's blog. I'm on Blogger, but you could also see some of my miscellaneous videos on YouTube under Stephen Gaber. Okay. And we'll look forward to uh, seeing more from you, Stephen. And we want to thank Autism Works Now for introducing us to you. And uh, that, was, that was a great thing that we got to meet you. And I hope this will continue for many occasions to come. There we do we too. Go. All right. We thank you so much for being with us. We're going to take a break, okay. and then we're going to be back with more. In fact, we're going to try to get to some of the questions you guys wrote in. Stick with thank us. Thank you. Hi everyone, welcome back. From the month of March, we're going to be making a rain stick. And what's really cool about this project is that the steps are pretty simple, so your kids are going to be able to practice a lot of their fine motor skills when making it. Another bonus is that once the rain stick is completed, you guys can use it for a bunch of different programs under cognition and executive functions. Things that deals with you know seeing versus hearing, or using it also for auditory memory but we'll get to that later. First, we gotta make the rain stick. So, the materials you'll be needing are a paper towel roll, tape, paper, aluminum foil, rice, and any kind of materials you want to use to decorate your rain stick with. All right, let's get to it. So the first thing you wanna do is get a piece of tin foil that's about double the length as your paper towel roll. I got this, and then what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna roll it up, like so, and I'm gonna wrap my paper towel roll with it. Okay, and don't worry if it's too messy, okay? This is to give us a basic shape. Now once I've got this, I'm gonna make it a little bit tighter, and I'm gonna roll it and stick it inside of my paper towel roll. I want to make sure that it goes all the way through the paper towel roll. And what this does, it acts like a buffer so the rice will go down slowly through the tube. And see how that's in nice and in there? Okay, now that I have that, I'm going to take a piece of paper and cover one side. And I'm going to take a piece of tape and secure it over the bottom. All right, now that I've got this on, I'm gonna take my rice and pour it in. All right, now that I got the rice in there, I'm gonna seal the other side. Now that this is constructed, don't forget to use your imagination to decorate this any way that you want. Here's my finished rain stick. Don't forget you can decorate yours however you see fit. I decided to use tape and pipe cleaners, but you could always paint it, add sparkles, just whatever you feel like doing. Now that this is done, let's take a listen to it. What does that sound like to you? I think it sounds like rain too. What does rain look like? Ah, that is what rain looks like. You can ask them a whole bunch of different questions using this after it's already been made. Well, until next time, craft on. Bye guys. Can you see me? Can you see me flying by your side? Hello there, a fellow activist. You're an activist because you're making the world a better place for someone living with autism. Now on Autism Live, you learn all about your children. You learn about their bodies and their brains. But this empowerment moment is all about you. It's about your heart and your soul. Now don't worry, I'm not gonna have you start singing Kumbaya or doing chanting. Let's talk about blessings. One of the blessings of living with a child with autism is learning to love them unconditionally. Learning to love them despite all the ups and downs, all the sacrifices. In fact, 
you learn to love them more so because of them. I call this my empowerment prayer. God grant me the wisdom to see my disability as an opportunity, the courage to love my child unconditionally, and the faith to live a life of purpose. So going from the sublime to the ridiculous, I have a little song for you today. It's a rap song, so I know that an old or, okay, middle-aged white woman rapping just doesn't seem right, but I'm gonna go for it anyway. My style is a little like Nicki Minaj meets Dr. Seuss. Nancy's Autism Rap. It's just a diagnosis, your life's not over. Don't lay there like a dog, get up, Rover. You say your head is spinning with GF, CF, ABA, IEPs, and neurofeedback? Autism tough, that much is true, but you'll survive because you're you. Your life's not over, it's just begun, so walk out that door and go be someone. More Dr. Seuss than Nicki Minaj. Until next time, stay strong and keep the faith. I love your rap. Oh, thank you. Your thank rap is fabulous. I mean, white women rapping just ain't right, though. <laughs> I don't agree. No? Why? That's a limiting belief, woman. Okay, limiting belief. Uh, let, let go of that. Maybe middle-aged, <laughs> or more than middle-aged uh, white women. Uh, let go of that. Yeah. <laughs> Whose rules are those? Anyway, uh, Nancy and I were going to take a couple of minutes to address as many of the questions as we can that you guys were sending in earlier. So starting with on Facebook, Sarah said, the teenage years I'm dreading. Yeah. My son is high functioning and everyone tells me by the age of 10, if they haven't shown aggression yet, he will. My son is seven now, so I'm thinking he's going to be getting more aggressive when he gets older. And we both read that and said, "Not necessarily. I don't. I don't. I don't follow I that." I think there are lots of kids on the spectrum that never show aggression. And and to be honest, um, you know what was said to me early on because my son was very aggressive when he was two and three and four and five. Right. And what got said As to was me was mine. Right. And what got said to me over and over was, "You need to take care of this right now." so that it doesn't continue on into later. And we did, and we very successfully took care of the aggression, and we don't, we don't have any aggression now, and, and really haven't had for a lot of years. And my son is 14, and he's huge now, and I knew he was gonna be huge. And I remember one mom saying to me, if you wait till he's 15, he's gonna pound you into the ground like a post. Right. And, and, I, and I wanna say to families that have aggressive kids, um, you know, sometimes with some kids, like I was lucky, I was lucky that it took us three years and we got the aggression under control. For some kids it takes longer, but that's for kids who are already aggressive. And, and it really takes a team when there's aggression. And, and I know that parents, we always go to that place of, okay, well, it's me. Because usually the aggression happens with the parents right. and not with other people. Right, because they feel safer with the parent to let those feelings Exactly, go. and it doesn't mean that it's your fault. Quite the contrary, no. but it means that you need support, right? But if your child has never been aggressive, there's no reason to assume that he would become right. aggressive just I know, because he's like 10. Like I said, many children on the spectrum that are never aggressive. Never aggressive. What you might see is that what I have seen with a lot of kids is that between the ages of 10 and 14, when the whole hormones kick in, there's a whole new level of giving them functional communication mm -hmm. and giving them the ability to communicate their needs because they now have new needs that they didn't, that they don't understand and that their body is doing different things. And that sometimes there are some kids who get so frustrated because they don't know how to communicate that things right. are happening in their body that some kids, you know, will hit something or some kids are aggressive towards other people sometimes that does happen but the truth is if you're working with a team they can help you with that make sure though that you get help but but please don't assume if he's seven and is and is not aggressing now you don't, don't assume that he's going to be yeah don't assume that he's going to be keep doing the things that you're doing keep reinforcing keep giving him ways to communicate when something happens keep those lines of communication open i'm i'm i I'm a big believer in over communicating and that isn't necessarily right for all kids. Um, but my son will say to me, stop, <laughs> you know, but, but I believe in talking about the things that are happening in their bodies 
and languaging it and letting them know before it happens um, so that they don't have to be afraid of it. Right. Um, and then there are ways of transferring. I mean, sometimes on occasion, Wyatt will still show some signs of aggression, but what he does is he rips paper. Yeah. So you transform it into something right. else. Great yeah. point, Nancy. Right. So it's it's an easier way than lashing out at, a, at another human. And and I have a friend who has a neurotypical son who's just, this, you know, awesome. And, and he, in the teenage years, was having a lot of feelings. I mm -hmm. think it's typical when you're a teenager. And she got him a set of bongo drums. And she said, you know, she cleared out a spot in his closet. And she said, this is your spot that you can go to that's safe. And you can bang on your bo bongo drums. And you can make whatever noise your body wants to make. And, and he would. He would go in that closet and bang on the bongo drums and let it out. Yeah, there are other ways you're doing boxing bags can yes. work, things like that. Yeah, and, and, and that plays right into, um, somebody had written in a question, Yasmin on YouTube, it said, um, uh, my seven-year-old with autism is very verbal, can tell me if he's hurt, and can ask me for everything he needs to, but he's very hyper, constantly moving or jumping. He's been on the GFCF diet for about four years with very minimal sugar intake. How can I teach him how to sit for longer periods of time and pay attention to? And thanks so much in advance. And just last night, um, I CARD has something called the, I don't talk about it much here on the show, but CARD has something called the CARD PTA. It's parents that are truly amazing. And once a month, I get on a phone call with as many CARD parents as want to. In fact, Nancy's going to be our special guest next month. Oh, am I good? Yes, you are. It's on your, it's on your schedule. Okay. You already said yes to it. Okay. But I'm reminding you right now. All right, good. But anyway, um, and so uh, we're on the call together, and I have guests that come on the call. And last night, our guest was Kara Kaczynski, the pocket OT. Mm -hmm wonderful occupational therapist who's a mom mm -hmm. of two kids on the spectrum. She really gets it. And she's got several books out. Really want to encourage you to check out her books. And her website is pocketot.com. Um, That's what it is, okay. pocketot.com. So uh, anyway, somebody was asking a question about when kids are hyper mm -hmm. and need to jump all the time. Mm -hmm. And she went through this great explanation about how there's the proprioceptive, and then there's the vestibular, and then there's the third one, which I'm gonna forget the name of it, but it's the more internal stuff. Mm -hmm. And she was saying that a lot of our kids, so your proprioceptive is understanding where you are in space, and the vestibular is understanding movement, and that we all have on our own, like little sensors mm -hmm. all over our skin. Mm -hmm. And when I raise my hand up into the air, that my sensors tell my brain your, your hand is moving, and we all need a certain amount of, of movement um, to feel good. Right. Think about if you, you know how, like I feel achy when I get off a plane mm -hmm. after sitting there for so many hours because my body didn't get to move. And that for our kids, sometimes they are hyper or under mm -hmm. censored. So some of our kids, it's like they're encased in a rubber suit. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if you and I go into the gym and we do some boxing mm -hmm. and afterwards we feel this well-being because we moved right. and, and, our, and we Endorphins understood it. And Endorphins, all that stuff. But some of our kids, it's like they're in a rubber suit and they're not getting all of the sensory information, so they need more of it. And she was saying a diet of heavy work. Now, heavy work is not lifting heavy things or, or putting a heavy backpack on somebody. It's not that. It's pushing and pulling and using the big muscles. That even, she was explaining to us to take your hands and put them together and push against your hands. And that is heavy work because it engages these muscles. So that you have like five or six activities. And you can go on her website or get one of her books and it'll tell you all of these things. And does she advise taking breaks to do this work? Yes. Or incorporating in what you're doing, but she says it's a diet. You know, we stop to eat mm -hmm. and that we need a sensory diet too. So for kids, yeah, but her point was you got to get there before. Right. So you take a baseline and see how often do they need to jump mm -hmm. and in what circumstances do they need to jump. And if you know you're going to church and they jump in church, mm -hmm. right, and you want to tone it down a little bit do beforehand, beforehand. You, you have the sensory diet right. and you always feed the diet before. And, and I know years ago, before I had a child, I, I, I still know this woman. She has two of the most incredible young men that she raised. And these were always the most well-behaved kids. And we would all look at her kids and go, how do you do it, Renee? How did you raise such amazing kids? And she said, oh, I'll tell you my secret. 
I run them like dogs. They are in the pool. I make them run every day. They are physically active. Physical there's, activity there's is no very important. Time. And, and you energy. are the queen of this. Um, and, and one of the things Kara was saying last night was being in the pool, swimming in a pool is automatically heavy work mm -hmm. because there's the pressure of the water against you that you're having to fight. It's resistance, mm -hmm. right? So, and I, I remember when I first met you, I was, you changed the way I looked at things, Nancy, because it was like, you know, well, you know, why it's going for a hike right now and why it's going in the pool and why it's, and I was like, oh, how much activity does this kid get? And he gets my a kid, lot of activity. But it's good for them. And especially if they've got that thing going on, they need it. They definitely need, they need it. it. I know my son does. He's a different child after he's had a hike or a walk yes. the dogs or gone for a swim. And the truth of the matter is, is that it, when you're doing those things and getting those endorphins, it helps to deal with the emotions. Yes, yeah, it regulates and the emotions. so for the other kiddo that the mom who's concerned about aggression in the teenage years, Keep him busy, yeah, keep him and busy. for this mom, keep him busy. Uh, a, a, a diet of heavy work is really good for our kids. Um, and then we only have like two minutes left, but Haley wrote in on Facebook and said, my main issue, six-year-old son, my main issue is that he doesn't accept when he can't have the things he wants to do or, uh, or, or despite us giving, not giving in or backing down. The thing is, we all have to have hope, right? And um, there's a whole set of lessons. I have my skills thing. Um, skills for autism .com or eight seven seven nine seven five four five five nine. The the thing is that a lot of times as parents we don't understand that there's a precursor missing to the lesson that we're trying to teach, and accepting when you don't get what you want. Oh my gosh, there's like twelve things that come before that, right? Because depending on what it is, we first thing we have to teach is waiting. Actually, you teach waiting in conjunction with appropriately asking for the thing mm -hmm. that you want, right? Mm -hmm. and, and because what he wants, maybe you can give it to him, but just not right now, mm -hmm. right? So you got to teach him how to wait. And that's a hard lesson to do, but there's like 12 other things in there too that you really got to do. And if you don't have waiting in place, he's never going to accept that he can't have what he wants and that he can't have it right now. Right. So in addition to that, we have to teach um, first this, then that, because that's part of waiting, right? First you're going to do this. And, and so it's a ton of different lessons, but I'm telling you, you can get them all on skills, skillsforautism.com. Um, one important thing to say here too yeah. is once you say you can't have something, you have to stick with it. Yes, but I will tell you this, that like don't put that out there unless you can follow through on exactly. it and unless it's reasonable because, um, and, 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 and you can't, you can't give in to it, right? If you say you can't have this, then you can't give in to it. But there's one little thing that's an out that you can renegotiate the deal. Um, and if you do, what you do is that they have to do something monumental to renegotiate to the re deal. So it. you can't have ice cream after dinner. And, the ch and if the child's having a meltdown and whatever, you don't, you don't renegotiate the deal because you don't, you don't negotiate with terrorists and a tantrum is terrorist behavior. Okay? We don't negotiate with terrorists. So that you just walk away from. And you're stuck. You said you couldn't have it. They're tantruming. We're done. But what you can do is teach your children to be little lawyers. Mm -hmm. Then you can say to them, well, you know, I really feel like you can't have a uh, thing after dinner. And you can teach them how to say, well, what could I do so I could earn it? Right. Right? And then, and, you, and if you have an ABA therapist help you to teach your child that, oh, they learn that so well. Yes, they do. And then they, they negotiate everything. Yeah. And then, then you have to remember, again, no negotiating with terrorists. Um, but if they ask appropriately, what can I do to earn that? Then you have to say to yourself, okay, what do I want? Right. All right. So, and, and in the beginning, you make it small, attainable things, but later on, you know, we, we're in the phase where we make things that are months in advance. Well, if you want a 3D printer, mm -hmm. and, but you have to make it so that it's feasible. Um, but anyway, you can do this. I would encourage you talk to your ABA team, ask them, have you taught waiting? And if they haven't, get skills, use skills to do that.